Good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Tamara Henry, and I serve as the Vice President for Academic Affairs and Academic Dean here at New York Theological Seminary. It is my honor to introduce this year's George Weber Lecturer, Dr. Miguel A. De La Torre. Dr. Miguel A. De La Torre is an international scholar, documentarian, novelist, academic author and scholar ac activist. The focus of Dr. Della Torre's academic pursuit is social ethics within contemporary U.S. thought with attention to how religion affects race, class, and gender oppression. He is the author of numerous articles and has published 41 books, six of which have won national awards. Currently, Dr. De La Torre serves as Professor of Social Ethics and Latinx Studies at Elif School of Theology in Denver, Colorado. A Fulbright Scholar, he has taught extensively in international contexts, including in Indonesia, Mexico, Germany, and South Africa, just to name a few. He served as the 2012 president of the Society of Christian Ethics and also as a past director of the American Academy of Religion. Dr. De La Torre is the recipient of a number of awards, including the 2020 Excellence in Teaching Award for the American Academy of Religion and the 2021 Martin E. Marty Public Understanding of Religion Award. New York Theological Seminary, please join me in welcoming our 2022 George Weber Lecturer, Dr. Miguel A. De La Torre. Buenas noches. My name is Miguel de la Torre, and I am very honored to be here um, speaking to you this evening, and a special thanks to New York Theological Seminary for their kind invitation. I, I want to begin tonight by, 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 by clearly stating that all enlightened, Eurocentric theology and philosophical thought is detrimental to communities of color. When the French cried out liberté, égalité, and franité, it was never meant for 
for the people in Vietnam, Haiti, or Algiers. You see, liberation was only for white French people. As a small child when I was in first grade, and I would say the Pledge of Allegiance, when I got to the line and liberty and justice for all, I knew that that line did not apply to me or to my people. Hence, Eurocentric philosophy and theology is constructed to exclude those that fall short of whiteness, thus justifying our oppression and repression and spiritualizing our disenfranchisement. How white America does Christianity and how they read the Bible damns all who are on their margins. I am often told that I should be speaking truth to power, but in all honesty, I don't wanna waste my time doing that anymore. Instead, what I am doing and what I'm hoping to do tonight is to speak truth to the powerless. You see, those who have power already know the truth and they refuse to engage in it because it is too profitable to remain ignorant of that truth. So my concern is with those on the margins who have adopted the truth of their oppressors as their own, and thus are self-disciplining themselves. So it's a nice conversation, and, and pretty much my entire uh, recent work deals with speaking truth to the powerless. Now, before I can confront Eurocentric Christianity, I really need to confront myself. In other words, I need to deal with my colonized mind. I remember as a young man in my 20s, um, I was driving from Miami, Florida to New York City, you know, in my red Capri. You know, here I am, hot Latino, driving my red sports car, my hair down to my shoulder, flapping in the wind, in the wind as I have my windows rolled down, listening to a gran combo. And as I was going through New Jersey, I get pulled over. And the trooper comes to my car. And the first thing he says is he asks if he can search my car. To which I said, yes, I, I you know, I, I wasn't going to argue with somebody that had a gun. So he searches the car and, and finds nothing. So I, I asked him, well, what exactly are you looking for? And his comment was, Young Latino men with Miami-Dade license plates are suspected of trafficking cocaine to New York City. This was back during the 1980s. As I drove away, what went through my mind was not the indignation of being ethnically profiled, but rather I was thankful that the cops were doing their job. You see, my mind was so colonized that I was literally seeing myself through the eyes of my oppressor. And this colonization of the mind is not just how I see myself, but how I constructed my worldview. You see, to get a PhD, I had to learn white ethics and white history and white theology and white um, liturgy. I had to learn the, the worldview of those who are profiting from my marginalization. And, and this is really blasphemous. How do I see with my own eyes? We embrace a Eurocentric faith that pacifies us in the very midst of our own oppression. Or too often, we are so busy seeking spiritual liberation that we ignore the physical liberation. 
believing in the riches of a hereafter rather than the here and now. And such a colonized mind, I believe, makes God vomit. My intellectual mentor, Jose Mati, probably said it best. El vino de plátano y si sale agrio sigue siendo nuestro vino. Now, for those of you who have yet to learn the language of the angels, let me let me translate for you. We will make our wine out of plantains. And even if it comes out sour, it's still our wine. You see, the first step of liberation becomes the decolonization of my mind. That is, learning to see with my own eyes, rooted in my own culture, rooted among my own oppressed people. And to do that, I have to reject Eurocentric philosophical and theological supremacy. Now, I argue that this process of liberation begins with the embracement of hopelessness. I, I took a group of students to Cuenavaca, Mexico, um, a few years back, and, and we visited the squatter villages on you know, La Estación, where the um, used to be an old train station tracks, and on those old tracks, people built literally huts made out of discarded wood and and, um, and, and, and and tin, tin um, walls. And, and while we were in the midst of such poverty, uh, my students were obviously um, uh, disturbed by it. So, so we, we went back in the evening um, to, our, um, to our little compound and we began to um, um, try to understand what we saw. And, and I never forget, there was this one white student who said, you know, the, the, the poverty is just horrible. But when I looked into the eyes of that little girl, I saw the hope in her eyes. And at that moment, I'll be honest, I had an epistemological meltdown because my response was, I'm not quite sure what you saw in her eyes, but in about another seven to eight years, she was gonna be turning tricks to try to put food on the table or be stuck in an abusive marriage. You see, for this little girl, there really is no hope. She will live and die in, pov in poverty, just like her children and even her children's children. Hope becomes something that those with economic privilege imposes upon the oppressed so we don't have to feel bad about how our riches is directly connected to their poverty. Now, speaking against hope, I realize I'm speaking against the gifts of the spirit, love, joy, peace, and hope. But the way hope has become defined is, an, is to be used as to domesticate those who are oppressed. And quite frankly, to go to those who are struggling with oppression and, and, and just repeat all things work for good uh, of those who love God and who have been called according to God's purposes sounds somewhat disingenuous and somewhat dismissive. Now, if I'm going to go ahead and root my philosophical and theological understanding on my own culture, I begin by realizing that hope in Spanish is esperanza. And the word esperanza comes from the, um, from the root word esperar. And esperar means to wait. You see, in Spanish, when we say hope, we really are saying wait. And sometimes waiting could last a lifetime. And sometimes we're not quite sure what we're even waiting for. I'm sure you've been in a service in where the preacher probably gave the, the story of the storm that, that, that washed over the beach and, and, and the beach was full of starfish that were dying. And there was a little girl walking the beach and she was throwing the starfishes all back into the ocean. And there was this grumpy old man who was seeing this and he yells out to her, to her you're not going to be able to save them all. And she picks up one and says, but I'll make a difference in this one. And 
throws it back in the ocean, and the congregation goes, ah, oh, what a beautiful story. I'm the grumpy old man. You see, I realize that no matter how much we try to throw these starfishes back, the majority are going to rot on the beach. And what we do is we lift up that one and we put them on the pedestal and we say, see, one of them survived, therefore we can have hope and thus ignore the hopeless situation of all the rest. I grew up in Hell's Kitchen back in the 60s when Hell's Kitchen was Hell's Kitchen. Um, and, 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 and then from there, we moved up into, in, into, a, uh, into the slums. Um, tenement building, one bathroom per, per tenement floor, uh, roaches, uh, rats, infected um, uh, building. Um, but I made it out. And you could put me on a pedestal and say, see, this Latino boy made it out and he did good. There is hope. But I cannot forget all my childhood friends who are now six feet under or who have been in jail or, or who have OD'd. You see, the success of one does not eliminate or ignore the the hopelessness of everyone else. I, I cannot have hope because the rotting flesh of these starfishes have filled my nostrils to the point that I cry out to the heavens, I cannot breathe. Now, Yugan Moltmann, the, the prophet of hope, tells us that we can have hope because we can trust in a God that keeps God's promises. But Primo Levi, the Holocaust survivor, instead tells us there is no God, only Auschwitz. Primo Levi basically shows us a God who failed to keep God's promises to God's chosen people. At the end of history, Moltmann says we could look back and see that God was always with us. But my fear is, as I look at the end of history and I look back and I see all the horrors, I instead cry out to a God who let such horrors occur. And here's the question. What if there is no such thing as history, as, as a linear upward progression of time? What if the horrors of the past is, are the horrors that awaits us in the future? What if there is no progress? What if at the end of history, all I see are the dead bodies of the past that just pile up in front of us? This is the argument that uh, Walter Benjamin was making. Every so often, Jesus appears in a tortilla someplace. Um, and in other words, we see the image of Jesus in, 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 in some you know, flower tortilla. And, and, and studies have been done on this. And what we've discovered um, is that the brain is wired to, to try to find order in disorder. This is why when you look at something like a wall that has a lot of um, stains on it, many times you begin to see a face. You try, your brain is trying to create order out of disorder. And I would argue that when we look at history, all too often we're trying to find order, that is the hand of God, in the midst of the disorder of history that has no reason or rhyme. Now, MLK may say that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. But I would argue that if it's going to bend towards justice, we are the one that has to do the bending because the moral universe could care less. More than likely, we will have more disorder and more oppression in the future if we are not doing the bending. Hence, the, Ecclesi the writer of Ecclesiastes says, vanity of vanity, says the teacher, absolute fertility, everything is meaningless. I have learned to be in radical solidarity with the oppressed. And if I'm going to do that, I have to embrace Holy Saturday, the, the space in where they live, where all they know is the, is the crucifixion and the violence and the gore of Friday. 
and not be sure that a Sunday resurrection will even come. This is the space where the vast majority of the world's oppressed find themselves. And to rush them to some good news of Sunday ignores the pain that they are sitting with on the Saturday and, quite frankly, is somewhat cruel to what they are experiencing. My fear of rushing to, to, to a Sunday is that it domesticates those who are being oppressed. I went to Auschwitz a few years ago, and, and when you walk through the gates, there's a sign above the gates that says, uh, work will set you free. See, the sign was placed there to give hope to those who are walking through those gates. But we know how the story ends. Those who walk through those gates, very, you know, the vast majority ended up being shoved into ovens. See, there was no hope. But if there is the illusion of hope, if I keep my head down, if I don't make waves, if I don't fight back, maybe I'll survive. When the fact is, I probably won't. Hope becomes a middle class privilege in where if you have sufficient whiteness and sufficient funds or sufficient power or sufficient privilege, you might be able to make it. But the, for the vast majority of the world that lacks those things, hope becomes an illusion that reinforces our own domestication so that we do nothing. I argue that when we have nothing to lose, when I embrace the hopelessness, that's when I become the most radical. That's when I will do whatever it takes to survive. And that's when opportunities of change can occur. And this is what I've been trying to, to formulate as a badass Christianity. You see, hope rejects, I mean, excuse me, hopelessness rejects quick fixes. Now, Moltmann would have us believe that the opposite of hope is despair. I disagree with him. You see, despair means I roll up in the fetus position and I gnash my teeth and I just lay there waiting to die. The opposite of hope is desperation. And there's a difference. I, I, I spend some time um, between the U.S. and the Mexican border walking the migrant trails, leaving water, food, and medicine. And every so often, I do come across um, a group of migrants. And, and I get you know, some time to talk to them and, and hear their stories. And, and one thing that I'm discovering of their stories is that the reason they walk into a desert, knowing that every four days, brown, five brown bodies will perish in that desert, is not because they have hope of succeeding in the United States. They'll know that when they get here, they'll be living in the shadows of this government, always fearful and anxious of being caught and deported. No, no, it's not hope that sustains their walk through the, des the desert. It's the desperation of knowing that if they stay, they will die and maybe their children will die. But if they cross the desert and risk it, they could still die, but they might be able to make it. It is that radical praxis that propels them into doing something out of desperation. Miguel Dunamuno, a philosopher that has definitely influenced my thoughts, ha has argued that um, it really doesn't matter if there is a God or if there is a heaven. That's not what's important. What's important is that we act and that we live as though there is. Now, now, now don't get me wrong. I've, I've, I believe in God and I, I, I believe in heaven and I picked out my mansion uh, when I get to heaven and, and everything's going to be cool. But, but, but what if there isn't? You see, 
not knowing, well, to, to try to prove that there's a God, you, you can't do that. You, you can't prove a God exists. And by the same token, you cannot prove a God does not exist. So believing that a God exists is what we call faith. Because if I could prove it, it's no longer faith. Faith is believing that which you cannot prove. So I have faith in a God that may not exist. And, and, and what this does is that the praxis that I engage in, the, 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 the struggle for social justice, is not based on getting some reward in some heaven in some future. There may not be a heaven. This may be all that there is. And it doesn't matter because I do not fight for justice thinking I'm going to get an extra ruby in my heavenly crown. If I do, then that's just a transactional arrangement. That's not faith. And I don't fight for justice thinking that I'm going to win because I probably will not. I mean, face it, we stand in the face of global neoliberalism that is making the you know the poor of the earth even more poor and, 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 and making the rich a small group of individuals. We live in a world where racism and anti-Semitism and, 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 and transphobia and homophobia are on a rise and people are literally being killed. And that's not gonna change anytime soon. In fact, I have no doubt that these isms will continue way after I'm dead and my children are dead and my children's children are dead. So I'm not fighting for justice thinking I'm going to win. I'm hopeless, I'm not. So why bother? I fight for justice because it defines the faith that I claim to have. And more importantly, it defines my very humanity. And this faith is not an attempt to seek what is the correct doctrine as to why people suffer, but rather to seek the correct action, the correct praxis that I must employ, fully aware of the injustice that this correct praxis can lead to my own demise. It is hopeless, but I do not walk away because the very struggle to survive is what defines me. So, what is this badass Christianity and how do we implement it in our lives? We have created an ethics, a, a way of being, a way of doing social protest in where we have to go to the police department in order to get a permit from the police department so that we can protest the police department for police brutality. We have domesticated protests. So I could carry my sign um, down, you know, uh, people's power, and I could march, and I could yell in the streets, and then I could go home, and I feel like I've done a lot, and nothing changes. Every so often, I, you know, I love where I teach. Uh, sometimes my um, white liberal uh, students come to me and say, hey, Dr. De La Torre, we're all going to go get arrested for such and such a cause. And my comment is, you know, I'm a Latino man. I don't have to try to get arrested. You see, getting arrested has become a way of getting your liberal credentials. Yet for my people, we avoid getting arrested because it serves no purpose except that money is spent keeping us out of jail as opposed to going to the cause that we're fighting for. Now, now don't get me wrong. 
there were times when you are fighting for justice that that may end up being the consequence, but it's a consequence we don't seek, is one we avoid. So, what I propose is what I have been right, calling in some of my other writings an ethics para joder. Now, for those of you who know Spanish, I apologize for my language. For those of you who have yet to learn Spanish, let me try to translate it. Jodel is a certain Spanish word that um, uh, is four letters long in English, begins with F and ends with K. It is an ethics that screws with the systems, that screws with the rules. It is an ethics um, of Jesus walking into a temple and overturning the tables and creating chaos. And, and let me be clear, I'm not inventing this ethics para jorel. I'm just giving voy uh, words to it. Uh, uh, I'm just defining what people of color have always done. They have always been tricksters within marginalized communities that screw with the dominant structures of power. I mean, in the indigenous community, you have uh, coyote and you have spider. Um, in the African-American community, you have bear rabbit and you have uh, bear bear. Um, Mexicans, Mexicanos have cantinfla. Puerto Ricanos have uh, Juan Bobo and we Cubanos, we have uh, Pepito. So, so, so cultures always have these trickster figures. I would argue that the Bible is full of tricksters figure. Everything from Tamar playing the prostitute to, to you know, to, to show those who have gender uh, uh, power over her, uh, specifically Judah, uh, how he is violating the laws of God, uh, to King David playing uh, the madman in front of the king so as not to have be slaughtered, um, to to um to 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 Satan, who I would argue is the ultimate trickster, not the personification of evil, but but a trickster, whether it be in the book of Job or whether it be tempting Jesus in the temple. I, I'm sorry, in in, in in the desert for 40 days. So so you always have these trickster images, but but in the biblical text, they've been beaten out because we have replaced that way of thinking with a Eurocentric uh, pietist. Um, um, interpretation of scripture. So, I, 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 as I mentioned earlier, if I'm going to make my wine out of my own indigenous roots, out of plantain, I have to go to the tricksters within my own culture. Um, when I was in, in Mexico, I, I had the opportunity to speak to a Chiapa rebel. And, and he told me the story of when the reason he, he became involved in the Chiapas is because the government was trying to take away his land. So he said he went to the government's office and he began to talk to them about, you know, the injustice. And they looked at him and said, ah, you smelly Indian, get out of here. So he said, and so I showed up the next day with a bandana over my face and carrying an AK-47. He said, you know what? They listened to me. We had an interesting conversation. You see, he was playing the trickster in order to get the government to do the justice that it should have been doing. Now, let me look at trickster images within my own Latino community here in the United States, because this is what really informed my own thinking. And I want to go to the young lords that were very active in New York City back in the late 60s, early 70s. And, and, and the young lords were a gang, but, but they be, the, the, the leaders were had their consciousness raised. So they, so they went ahead and they decided to clean up the streets of New York City, of, of, well, not New York City, but of uh, Spanish Harlem. And, 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 they, and they cleaned the streets, they, they swept the streets, they put all the garbage in bags, they put it on the corners, and they called a sanitation department and basically said, hey, we, we, we just... Um, clean up the streets, would you mind coming by and, and picking up the garbage? And the sanitation department, you know, looked at the, you know, said, ha, we'll go whenever we feel like it and hung up on them because, you know, they, they just showed up whenever they had extra time to pick up garbage in Spanish Harlem. 
So the young lords went ahead and they took all those garbage bags and they went to Third Avenue and they built a wall and they set it on fire during rush hour traffic. Cops came, beat them up, threw them in jail. But also the New York Times came out and started doing articles about the sanitation department and how it does not take care of certain parts of town. Now, of course, the sanitation department shows up every Tuesday and Fridays to pick up garbage in Spanish Harlem. Uh, the point I'm getting at, what the Young Lords did was it held the government responsible to its own rhetoric by screwing with the system. Following the rules will get them absolutely nothing. But being creative in disrupting the structures themselves is what led to change. I'll give you another example. Um, during Advent, the young lords went to um, La Primera Iglesia Metrorista in Spanish Harlem and talked to the pastor and said, hey, look, pastor, you know, <clears throat> we want to go ahead and have um, uh, breakfast in the morning for our children going to school so they could have some nourishment. We, we love to have a clothes drive. We like to have an attorney you know, on, 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 at the church so that we could help our people with legal problems. It'll be great to have classes on consciousness raising about being Latinos. And 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 the pastor looked at them and says, ah, you, you commies, get out of here. So the next Sunday they showed up and doing Sunday service and they picked up the pastor and threw him out. And they nailed on the on the doors the people's church. And 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 then at that point the church really became the people's church. People started showing up because the church was doing the work of the church. You see, uh, and again, after a few weeks, the cops came, beat them up, threw them in jail, and, and all this. But the but the point is, the young lords held the church responsible for the rhetoric that they say. So to play the trickster, uh, to, to, to do this ethics para jorel, is an attempt to, to, to find ways uh, you know, beyond, over, and against the rules that society sets to, to, to maybe bring new opportunities that can change the structures themselves. Um, I am a child of Elegua. Uh, those who know will know what I'm talking about. But Elegua is the ultimate trickster in the uh, Yoruba traditions, um, uh, which, which was part of uh, the, became part of the Cuban culture and, and its religiosity. So if I'm going to do my Christianity rooted in my own um, culture, then I need to go ahead and look at that culture. And Elegua is part of my culture. It doesn't fit a Eurocentric way of understanding Christianity. And that's why I said from the beginning, all forms of white Christianity, philosophy, and theology has to be rejected if we're going to find liberation and salvation and if we're going to find the, the, the foundation upon which to, to do our ethics, uh, to practice our faith. So this badass Christianity is a Christianity of jodiendo, the power structures that keep our people oppressed. It, it becomes an ethics in which I engage that, 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 that helps me understand how I can nonviolently lie in the hopes of discovering what is true. Uh, how I can cheat so as to create a, a fair playing, a, a level playing field how I can steal so I can feed the hungry and feed the poor. How my jokes disrupt the what's acceptable as being pious and how my deceptions and my deceiving becomes a way 
of overcoming the big lie and all the little lies of the dominant culture. This is what I mean by a badass Christianity. This is what I mean by implementing an ethics para joder. Muchas gracias. So good evening, good evening. We are so grateful uh, for this opportunity to be in conversation um, with Dr. Miguel de la Torre. Uh, so grateful for such an amazing um, Weber lecture that really pushed us um, to think outside of the box um, and to move our margins just a little bit further out. Um, so, so happy to have you with us, Dr. De La Torre. Thank you again uh, for being our 29th uh, annual George W. Weber lecturer this year. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very honored to be here. <laughs> Wonderful. So I just really wanted to have some some time just to be in conversation um, about your lecture. Um, again, so grateful. Um, you start us off just talking about this notion of Eurocentric theology and philosophical thought um, and how detrimental it is to communities of color. Um, you talk about how it justifies our oppression and spiritualizes our disenfranchisement. Um, I would love if you could give us an example of what that looks like so that we can make sure we have really an understanding of what you're talking about. Well, I mean, just look at Hegel, for example, in where for him, <clears throat> the apex of uh, civilization and the apex of intellectual um, understanding comes in Central Europe. Um, that is the, the, the highest you can achieve any type of knowledge. Um, and, and that's problematic for those who do not come from Central Europe, who are not German. Um, so, so, you know, everything that is philosophically rooted in Eurocentric thought has been designed in such a way to make sure that those on the margins of Central Europe are kept on the margins and, and are justified mm -hmm. to be on the margins. So mm -hmm. trying to use a philosophical uh, foundation by which um, marginalized people to, to try to uh, determine their own form of resistance um, makes them only complicit with their own oppression. So, mm -hmm. so we really have to think about how do we do our thinking? How do we do our, um, our, 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 uh, develop our worldview apart from this Eurocentric way that justifies uh, white supremacy for the last couple of centuries. Hmm. Absolutely. Um, and when we think about this notion of supremacy, we've certainly heard um, this word much more in this season that we're in, um, social and politically. Um, I wonder if you you have or or can speak to the notion of Christian supremacy, um, how we have taken. Um, what we've learned from those who have oppressed us in the past um, and then kind of engage somewhat in our own, you know, uh, spiritual um, oppression, suppression. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. I mean, one of the things that we see all too often in, in many denominations now that are splitting apart is that um, many of the individuals who are more conservative theologically are the descendants of those who were um, taught by the missionaries who went to their country teaching a fundamentalist Christianity that's over a century old. And while liberal Christianity may have moved on, the damage done by these um, former missionaries is coming back to haunt Christians in this country. So that's mm -hmm. one example, of, I think, of how yeah. um, our own minds have been so colonized that we view Christianity through these lens that not only are detrimental to to all individuals, but specifically to people of color. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I was really moved by your uh, retelling of saying the Pledge of Allegiance as a child mm -hmm. uh, and how even then you knew that liberty and justice for all um, did not apply to you or your people. 
Um, and, and so it goes back to this notion of the things that we say and do we really believe what we're saying or are we really being indoctrinated? Mm -hmm. um, so can you talk about the paradox of saying these words but not necessarily experiencing them for yourself? And how, how were you so wise as a child uh, to recognize that that didn't apply to you? I don't think it was an issue of wisdom. It was an issue of experience. I mean, mm -hmm. even in first grade, I knew what it is not to belong. I mean, I remember one of my earliest memories is seeing people spit out my spit on my father, calling him a spick. You know, those images burn into you. So I knew that we were different. We did not, we weren't part of this, this liberty and justice for all. We just did not belong. Uh, we couldn't speak the language. I mean, I didn't learn English until I was in first grade. We couldn't, you know, you know, we, we were looked down upon. Um, you know, I would have to serve as an interpreter to my parents when they were older, and I could just see the the way they treated my parents in the tone of their voices. So all these things basically, um, from a very early age, made me understand that there is not, you know, that we're not all equal, we're not all the same. There is a two-class system, if not a three or four-class system, and we weren't part of that first class. So when I said the Pledge of Allegiance, not to say it would make me very unpatriotic. Pa patriotic. Um, it would make me, uh, you know, hating America. But the reality of my life just did not jive with, with, with the words that were coming from my mouth every morning in elementary school. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So true. So true. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, now, one of the things that really arrested me about your lecture um, is when you talked about this notion of speak or moving from speaking truth to power uh, to speaking truth to the powerless. Um, those you say, those who have power already know the truth, um, sometimes an ignorant truth. Uh, but I know there's a difference between a truth and the truth. Can you talk a little bit more about the importance of making that transition? Yes. I think all too often those who are from the margins of society are trying to convince those who are powerful to let them in, to, 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 mm -hmm. to, to accept them as equals. And those who are powerful do not want to do that because to do that means they will have to sacrifice. They'll have to give up a certain degree of privilege, a certain degree of profit, a certain degree of power. So when I say that they already know the truth, what, what I mean is they already know what it's going to cost for tr there to be true equality, for there to be a true justice and for all. Um, and, and they don't want that. They want to maintain and hold on to this white affirmative action, a, a structure that privileges them over and against everyone else, regardless of their qualification or lack thereof. Mm -hmm. um, so to truly move towards something more equitable means they will have to give up uh, what they consider the birthright. And, and they don't want to do that. So rather than wasting my time, I, you know, I, I no longer want to speak to them. I want to speak to those who are already on the margins who, like myself, had their minds so colonized that mm. they couldn't even see how they were complicit with their own oppression. Mm. Wow. Thank you. Um, and speaking of the, the colonized mind, uh, that's another theme you talk through um, in, in this lecture. Um, and you talk about this notion of seeing a spiritual liberation as opposed to a physical liberation um, and how that has uh, uh, been used, right, as, as a tool of oppression. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about um, what, what does the work of decolonizing the mind look like in 2022? Mm. For me, decolonizing my mind meant going back to my own cultural roots going back to how my own culture determines its worldview, which is very different than the worldview of the dominant culture. So I could give you an example. Um, and I talked about this, I think, towards the end of the lecture when I talked about uh, playing the trickster um, mm -hmm. in doing one's ethics. I mean, I come from a culture uh, from the Caribbean where the, um, where the um, Yoruba Orisha Elegua 
plays a very prominent role in my culture. And he is the ultimate trickster. So mm-hmm. how do I learn from my cultural roots how to do my faith? And mm-hmm. what that has done, it has led me to this whole way of um, understanding ethics as a form of playing the trickster for those who are oppressed. And this is nothing new. I mean, oppressed people have been doing this all the time. I'm just trying to put words to it and try to claim it as part of my own identity. So I think that's how I've been decolonizing my mind, moving away mm-hmm. from this uh, Puritan um, purity type of Christianity towards something that's a little more messy, a little more contradictory, mm-hmm. a little more problematic. Um, and, and, and I think in in doing that, I, I, I become more more real, more authentic in in in, in my faith. Absolutely. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I certainly uh, wanted to um, to lean into that thought a little bit more. Um, yeah, you talk about this at the end of the lecture um, and how our liberation doesn't fit um, in a Eurocentric way of Christianity. Uh, you talk about this notion as using deception as a way of overcoming the big lie mm-hmm. uh, and all the little lies of the dominant culture. Um, and how we can non-violently lie, right, in the hopes of discovering what is true. Um, you say, how do we cheat, right, to create a level playing field? How do we steal uh, to feed the hungry and the poor? You know, how do we tell jokes that disrupt uh, the acceptable biases and, and piousness um, of, of Christians? Um, and certainly living in New York City, where crime is at, a, at almost an all-time high and moving in that direction, um, what does it look like for us to engage in these practices in a way that builds community, yeah. um, even our own community, and doesn't tear it, tear it apart? And I think that last word you use is important, community. Mm-hmm. When I say these things, I cannot do it as an individual. And, and that whole individuality is part of the Eurocentric way of doing Christianity that must be um, um, uh, overcome, must be um, ignored, must be rejected. We're not an individualistic faith. We are a community. Um, and, and many of our communities, whether it be the African-American, the Asian community, the Latinx community, we are all about community. I mean, we've always been very much into community. My fear is that we're losing that. My fear mm-hmm. is that we are adapting and assimilating to this Eurocentric understanding of hyper-individualism. So to play the trickster, it's not something that I individually choose to do. And, you know, and, I, and I go into this in greater detail in, in, in one of my books on Latino Latina social ethics. It has to be done in a communal fashion. We as a community choose to play the trickster. And we hold each other accountable so that we don't um, um, instead um, do things that are not morally ethical. See, the problem with tricksters is that they are beyond good and evil. Tricksters could do good, but they could also do evil. And we want to avoid that evil. And that's part of the messiness of life. And community holds us accountable to this. Yeah. yeah so, I mean, I, I would good. say, for example, when um, when MLK would send the children out to, to march so the children could get arrested, that's him playing the trickster. Um, mm-hmm. And he did it at 6 o'clock in the evening, or no, 6.05 in the evening, right after the evening news began. So it could capture, it'd be in, in everyone's um, living room. That's mm-hmm. playing the trickster, but that was done mm-hmm. as a community. It wasn't an individual choice. The people came together and said, this is what we're going to do. That's good. That's that's good. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. And I think um, you're really on to something, um, certainly as we think about the implications of doing this as an individual versus engaging um, this, this fight as a community. Um, so, so thank you. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about hope. Ah, uh, you you <laughs> pushed me. You pushed me, Dr. De La Torre, when you talked about um, this hope, kind of this illusion of hope. Um, and when you said there's no hope for the little girl, you know, it just it just kind of broke my heart. Um, but I, I understand. I understand, and it makes sense. This notion of hope being an ideal. Um, of the economically privileged um, that's imposed upon the oppressed, right? Um, As a way for us to disassociate our riches um, connected to others' uh, poverty. Um, 
you talk about how hope is used to domesticate the oppressed and this notion of esperanza, right? I'm, I'm working on learning the language of the angels, this notion of esperanza, uh, right? That, that means to wait. Um, and so I wanna hear a little bit more about how um, leaning into hopelessness, right? Um, can actually be an ideal to uh, preserve even a reality um, for those who are experiencing the worst of their oppression, the worst right. um, you know, of their pain. And how do you hold that um, um, in conjunction with the notion that, that Jesus, right, who, who is, is the great liberator of, Christian, of our Christian context, or we consider um, him to be, um, and the fact that he um, leaned into hope and, and spoke of hope and preached and taught hope um, in the context where he was not a part of the privileged class, right? Um, and it's so interesting because I went back and, and did some reading. I said, you know, Paul talks about hope a whole lot and he's privileged, right? Mm -hmm. Jesus talks about hope as well, not as privileged or not privileged at all. Um, certainly not in the, in the same context as, as Paul was. So help us wrestle with this notion of hope because this is what is preached from pulpits. This is what keeps us moving, um, keeps us faithful, um, keeps us looking toward, toward a future, uh, a faith, having a faith in a future that we haven't seen yet. Um, so so, so pull, stretch that out a little bit more uh, and give us a better understanding of that. So, so let me be very clear. If someone has hope, it is not my job to take their hope away. That is not what I try to do. Uh, quite the contrary. If they have hope or power to them, you know, hallelujah. I, I, I remember once I, I met a man in the desert who was crossing the desert and he dropped his two jugs of water. And he said that the Virgin Mary appeared to him and led him to me because I had water. And at that, I, I wasn't about to, you know, deconstruct what he was saying. Instead, I said, hallelujah, you know, praise the Virgin Mary. I'm so happy. You know, I'm not, I'm not about to take away someone's hope. However, when I was writing the book, Embracing Hopelessness, at the time, my TA um, was a gang member and he ended up getting arrested again and he was thrown into the county jail. So he asked if he could take my manuscript with him. And I said, sure, it wasn't published yet. And he did a book study with other gang members at the jail, other Latino gang members. And his comment afterward was, you know, they got it. They understood what you were talking about, this hopelessness stuff. That was not a problem for them. Mm -hmm. and, and what that told me is that, for, you know, that, that this whole conversation of hope works great if you're part of a faith. But when you have nothing, what do you do then? And my fear is so too often when there's such hopelessness, we end up going to do things that are detrimental to our body or detrimental to our society. Yeah. So what I'm trying to do is, number one, recognize that there are people who are totally hopeless. B, not shame them because they're hopeless and say, well, why don't you have hope? Don't you know Jesus died for you? No, mm. but, but, but to sit with them in that hopelessness. And I think that's what it means to be in solidarity with the oppressed, one of those tenets of liberation theology, to meet them where they are. And that is in the hopelessness. And then use that hopelessness to propel them towards action that could be liberating. Um, mm. But also recognizing that we will probably still fail anyway. I mean, face it, after both you and I are long gone, racism will continue to be a major in ingredient of this country. You know, classism will continue to be very uh, a major ingredient of this country. I mean, these structures of oppressions will continue way after we and our children and our children's children have passed on. So that the hope that we're going to arrive at you know, at, 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 at utopia, it's not going to happen. So knowing that and recognizing that, I don't get discouraged in the fight. You know, mm. I've been on immigration now for 20 years. I'm not burned out because it never depended on me in the first place to fix it. I'm not the savior. Instead, I'm called to be faithful to what I claim my faith is to be, regardless mm. of the consequences. And I would have, you know, and I ask my students all the time, do you fight for justice because you think that you're going to win in the end? Mm -hmm. or, or do you fight for justice because you have no other choice is what defines your humanity? You know, and I hope the answer is the latter, not the former. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which is why so many social workers get burned out so quickly. 
because they think they're going to change the world and nothing changes, things just get worse. Mm. I mean, our political situation now is worse than it was when I was growing up and it was kind of bad yeah. back in the 60s. Right. <laughs> <laughs> But. Right. Uh, it's it's interesting. I had a um, a friend of mine whose um, wife is going through um, chemotherapy, and he was saying that um, in the building they have a picture of a snail, um, and the message was even small progress is progress, right? Mm -hmm. And so we we have seen the progress, but we also see um, the struggle and mm -hmm. and how the struggle has been nuanced. Um, that that it even appears that it's worse now than it was then. Um, but I, I was really arrested um, by this this notion of the fact that Sunday's not coming for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. um, you talk about how in Christianity um, we are so busy moving from Friday into Sunday, and we're ready to to sing and shout hallelujah because of Sunday. Um, but what happens to those who are stuck on Friday night and who are stuck all day Saturday? Yes, um, and how this notion? Um, go ahead. No, no, absolutely, absolutely. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm just agreeing. Yeah. I yeah, mean, how this notion of getting to Sunday um, can even be cruel, right? I never thought of it as 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 cruel, right? I'm thinking about when you said um, how we how we say all things work together, you know, for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to God's purposes. Well, that may be our experience or my ex privilege as, as a privileged American, but it's not everybody's experience. Right. And so how do we navigate between the terrain of Friday and Sunday, right? For those who may not get to Sunday, where, where is the hope and where is the accountability, the call to action and the solidarity that's required in those circumstances? You know, one of the things that I, th I think the churches do a great disservice um, doing Easter weekend is that we, you know, we all get come together on on Thursday and we celebrate, you know, we not celebrate, but we recognize the crucifixion, and then we rush to Easter Sunday with a tremendous explosion of joy, and, and that's nice. But what happened to Saturday? What happened to that period of time where the vast majority of the world's people are living in right now, mm. where, where there is no Sunday coming along, where they may never see a Sunday in their life. You know, and, and and that's where where my theology and my ethics is rooted in 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 those stories, not the stories yeah. of people like myself who have mm -hmm. finally achieved middle class privilege. Yeah. You know, now that I have middle class privilege, yeah, I mean, I could have all the hope. I mean, I I have hope because I have enough money in my savings account to you know to mm -hmm. hold me over during a difficult time, and I have hope because I have you know um, all kinds of economic privilege. Um, but but. I still remember what it was not to have enough food to eat and, yeah. and, and knowing that there's a lot of people who are still in that situation today. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I know our time is short. I really want to keep this conversation going. I want to just ask you one last question and then want to give you the opportunity to share anything else that you would like for us to remember or to emphasize um, before we close this conversation. Tell us how you have been able in all of the work that you've done uh, to publish over 100 articles, 41 books. Um, give us some hopes. We got a lot of budding theologians watching this, a, a lot of faculty are, who are trying to navigate the terrain of balancing. Uh, tell us how, how have you um, disciplined yourself to the extent to be able to do all that you have done in, in a relatively short amount of time when you think about it? Well. Uh, first of all, it's 43 books now, so, oh, but, yes. but who's counting? <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you. This one just came out today. Um, uh, upside down. It just yes. came out today. In, uh, Resisting Apartheid America. I, I just mm. got in today's mail. Congratulations. Um, Thank, you. You. Thank you. But um, honestly, it's, first of all, I want to be very clear. I'm not a great writer. I mean, English is my second language. I type with one finger. I mean, I'm not, uh, you know, I, I struggle for words. Um, so, so, so for me, it was really just time management. Um, mm -hmm. If I just write three, three pages a day for 230 pages or 230 days a year, that's 630 pages. That's about two books a year, which is what I've been averaging. So I just sit down and do my work. And part of it is because my previous job, my first job that I ever got was mopping floors at $5 an hour. Wow. I mean, I'm sorry, $5 a week, 
mopping floors at five dollars a week and i had to mop those floors regardless if i felt motivated if i felt inspired mm -hmm. it didn't matter if i was inspired or motivated i just had to mop right. those floors and writing is a lot more fun than mopping floors <laughs> <laughs> this is wow. a lot you know for me it's a job um yeah. there is so much not just myself but people of color have so much that they have to say yeah. that we're not saying because you know we, we've been taught an imposter syndrome which i which i hold on to and i wrestle with we've been taught that we don't belong in the academy which i've been told that ever since i decided to get a phd we've been told that our words are really just an opinion and that deep rigorous scholarship we've been told all these lies mm -hmm. and 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 we are the ones that need to proclaim the good news of liberation because no one else is doing it. So yeah. for me, it's not just a job that I do. It really is a calling and a ministry that I have no choice but to do. Um, and, and, I, and, and I would really encourage all my fellow uh, scholars of color, you know, to forget all of these, uh, all this baggage that the Academy has placed upon us and just let's start writing. Uh, you know, it's, what we're writing now will begin to influence a future generation of, of, of seminarians and scholars, and they need to hear our voices. We, we owe it to them. Uh, and more importantly, we owe it to our ancestors um, who mm. could not write, but yet we can. Mm. We yeah. owe it to them as well. Wow. Thank you so much. Are there any last words you want to share with us before we close out? You know, first of all, thank you again for inviting me to be part of this. Um, I wish I would have done a New York in person. I'm an old New Yorker, uh, you know, Queens boy, uh, 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 Jackson Heights. So uh, mm. I miss the city. But, 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 but here's what I hope people would take away. Number one, I hope people don't agree with me 100%. I mean, that would be scary if anybody agrees with me 100%. I'm just sharing what I've noticed among the circles that I run in, among those who are oppressed, uh, those who are truly hopeless. And I'm trying to understand how to work and, and, and be in, in, in solidarity with them. If what I say, some of it makes sense, great to wrestle with it. If, if what I say, if you want to hold on to hope, hold on to hope, no big deal. But if you do come against someone who is totally hopeless, have a little more patience, have mm -hmm. esperanza, wait uh, yeah. with them. Uh, yes. Wow. Thank you so much, uh, everybody. Uh, Dr. Miguel de la Torre, it has been such a blessing. And thank you for blessing uh, the New York Theological Seminary community. God bless you and your work and your writing. And we look forward to the next time we can be together. Absolutely. I look forward to it. Adios. Adios.